thy faithfulness morning by morning through mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness lord unto me what a great lord we have you may be seated Yeah, what a mighty God, great God we serve, amen? Amen, indeed. Bear with me uh, momentarily here as I transition into our uh, next segment here of our service where we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. If I have my Bible, is my Bible on the back table there maybe? <laughs> That'll be helpful. <laughs> Thank you. That's what you're here for, not to hear me talk. <laughs> Well, if we have uh, any who are looking to uh, go to nursery, we could probably go ahead and dismiss them now. I know we've got some over there with, uh, with Jill right now, but if we have others that want to uh, go, Caitlin will take you over there. Thank you. I'm not sure that we do. Everybody else might be staying, and that's great. So we certainly uh, encourage to keep the kiddos in here. Whenever you parents feel like they are uh, able to stay, the crying and the uh, distractions and all those things will not be a distraction from what we're doing. We certainly uh, want them to be in the house of the Lord to worship as well. Such an influential time, right, as I think about my own kids and just raising them when they were young and they were little. And uh, I saw somebody put a post even, I think, out on Instagram or something this week. I'm not on there a lot, but I saw uh, somebody put something out about kind of the idea was like dragging your kids to church. And uh, a lot of people feel like, ah, you know, I don't want to make them sit through there and do those things. And yet, uh, we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So uh, we want our children to be under the, the preaching of the word of God and to hear the word of God as much as they can. And so we certainly want to encourage you to, uh, to have them in here and to, uh, to be at church wherever you are. So this morning, uh, we are going to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, as I said, before we start into the, the sermon today. So I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Certainly welcome to turn there with me if you would like. And we do have... Uh, the single cups here still, and we practice uh, what's called an open table uh, communion, so uh, I know we got a lot of visitors here today. Uh, you don't have to be a member of our church to partake in communion. Uh, the only prerequisite we have is the one we see in scriptures, uh, is that you uh, profess faith in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and so as we get uh, into the text here, I think we will see that, and often like to give instruction uh, around this, because yes, communion is a celebration, uh, we celebrate what it is the Lord has done in remembrance of it, right, and what he's done for us on the cross some 2,000 years ago. Uh, but it's also a time of personal reflection, a time to examine yourselves, uh, as we see here in the text here. So I'm going to come and read from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning verse 23. Paul, uh, the author inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus and the night that he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so uh, doing he eat, is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. And I'm going to stop there, and Paul continues to go on and to say, you know, it's for this reason that many of you are sick and that many of you have actually died in the church because uh, there was a, a significant problem in the church at Corinth here uh, that we're in the kind of the end of this letter here where Paul is saying uh, to the church, you're 
you're not maturing in the right way. You're not doing things the right way. And one thing he points to is the Lord's Supper and how they were performing it and how they weren't doing it in accordance to God's will. And so even as we uh, come to this part or this element, uh, if you will, in our liturgy or in our worship service, as we sing, as we give, as we uh, practice the sacraments, as we preach the word, remember, all those are elements of worship right? Everything that we do in our lives is to be about worship. And so uh, as I think about that, it is God who is prescribed for us how he desires to be worshiped. And so the church at Corinth was struggling with this, and Paul was helping to kind of guide them and steer them to get them back on course. And so in this, I see a few things, uh, a few teaching points and application for us to say that we do this in remembrance, again, of the gospel, of what Jesus has done for us. And it says, as you partake of this, you are proclaiming the truth of the gospel until he comes. And so it says, as often as you do it, it doesn't say you have to do it every week or that you have to do it once a month or once a year or whatever it may be. It says, whenever you do it, this is how you do it. This is why you do it. And we remember what Christ has done for us. And it says in there, did you catch that? That as often as you do it, you're proclaiming the Lord until he comes. So as we partake of these elements, which are just a little cracker and grape juice, there's nothing special about these things. Uh, they do not change or, uh, you know, we don't ascribe to transubstantiation to, to say that this is the body and blood of Christ. These represent the body and the blood of Christ, which he gave on the cross willingly uh, so that we could have life through him. And that's what he's saying is as we do this as a body, we're actually presenting and proclaiming the gospel and what we do because of the body and the blood that it represents here. Uh, He also says not to partake in an unworthy manner. And so I would say to you, first and foremost, an unworthy manner would be uh, that if you do not profess Christ, if you do not believe in him by faith, and perhaps a friend brought you, or perhaps you're visiting, if you do not profess faith in Christ uh, and believe that, that salvation is through Christ alone and by faith in him, then I would urge you and I would warn you, in fact, as Paul does here, to say do not partake of these elements together. Uh, no one's looking around and judging anyone here. Uh, you know, it's, it's to be between you and the Lord, but also as a believer, I think that we could uh, feel like we're unworthy to partake of the Lord's Supper also. Perhaps there's uh, some type of sin that is holding you back in your relationship with the Lord. Uh, that remember, when we sin, uh, it doesn't, we don't lose our salvation, but we certainly uh, lose our fellowship uh, with the Lord. And so uh, there can be a gap there with, with our walk with the Lord. And so uh, this is a prime time to do that. We're going to take a few minutes uh, of silence here to pray. Uh, there may be something in your life that you are holding on to, some type of resentment, unforgiveness towards another brother or sister or, or someone else like that that you need to rectify. And so I would say to you, as Paul says, let a man examine himself and then partake of the elements. So I want to give each of us an opportunity now, uh, a a few moments here, to just uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Ask the Spirit to reveal things in your life that perhaps you're not even thinking of, uh, sins that you uh, may have against someone else or they may have against you that you need to to fix and you need to right. uh, Because we know the one that we're serving, the one that we're recognizing, he is a God of reconciliation. He is a God of forgiveness. He is a God of love and mercy, and he's called us to do the same. So let's go ahead and and take a few minutes here uh, in silence to pray, and then we'll come back together and partake.
let's uh, come back together and we'll partake of the elements here together. And if you just want to peel back that top layer and expose the wafer, we can get that out. And then you might want to pre-do uh, the juice. Be careful as uh, it can be messy. Difficult sometimes too, apparently. Okay, I have turned to uh, the Gospel of Matthew, <coughs> chapter 26, where we see the night of his betrayal that uh, Paul was alluding to. And verse 26 says, While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise because you are worthy of our praise. As we uh, just sang those words, what truth, uh, Lord, it is that you are worthy of our thanks, you're worthy of worship, worthy of praise. Uh, that your grace is greater than all our sins. And as we read your word, we, we find that truth as you reveal these truths to us, Lord. Uh, as we come to a, a time of, of prayer together, so many things, uh, Lord, flood into my mind because uh, we have so many things going on in our lives. And uh, some that I, I know that are here and, and some visitors that I don't know, but I do know that, that we are all human. And so I know that your word tells us that in this life we will have difficulties, we will have tribulations. Uh, but we are to be a good cheer because you've overcome the world. And so, God, uh, we know that we go through difficult times, uh, a lot of hardships, whether those be uh, financial hardships, whether they be emotional struggles, physical things, Lord, uh, so many who are going through uh, cancer uh, treatments and uh, healings and all kinds of things, Lord, uh, that, that happen to, to these lives, to these fleshly bodies uh, and, and the things we continue to struggle with. But, God, again, uh, we give you thanks that we can rejoice in these things because we understand that these bodies are temporary, that this place is not our home, this body is not our home, this, this earth is not our home, uh, but we look forward, Lord, to, to a day uh, and a place that you are preparing for us. And so as your children, uh, Lord, we come to you with our prayer requests, we lift them to you, and so the things on our heart, God, I just ask that your will would be done in all of them, uh, that you would receive the glory, and we uh, give you thanks in advance because we know uh, that as your children that you are using everything in our lives to conform us into the image of your Son. And so, God, we give you thanks for that. Pray today that as people hear this gospel message, uh, if they do not know you, that they would come to know you today, that you would uh, open eyes to hear, uh, uh, excuse me, open eyes to see, open ears to hear, Lord, that this gospel message that is proclaimed would bring eternal life to people. And, Lord, to us, the church who believe in it, uh, this gospel message is still for us today and every day, that we would be reminded of the gospel every day because we need the gospel every day. We need you desperately every day, Lord. Pray for this text this morning. I pray for a blessing, uh, that your spirit would be our primary teacher, uh, that you would give us understanding, uh, that you would illumine our, our hearts and our minds, uh, that you would saturate it, Lord, and, and have your word permeate into our, our hearts, into our minds to transform us, uh, that we would be more like you, that we would be more uh, pleasing to you, that we would love you more, that we would uh, be of better use, Lord, for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Well, we are going to be in Romans chapter 7. So if you've got your Bibles out, uh, please go ahead and uh, open up. And I said 7, I meant 6, I'm sorry. I am open to 7, but I'm back on 6. So Romans chapter 6, we got through the first half of it uh, last week, in fact, to verse 14. So we pick up in verse 15 here this morning. And uh, we're going to be talking about slavery. Uh, so when you think of slavery... What kind of feelings does, does that invoke? What do you think about when you hear the word slavery? Uh, it's probably not positive, right? For, for most of us, I think the word slavery brings a negative connotation. Uh, it, we might think of, uh, you know, the Civil War and the things that happened in, in the 19th century there in this country and how it continues to have effects on our, on our nation and on our world even today. Uh, and you don't even really have to think back even that far because if you just go and, and do a little bit of homework and do a little bit of research about human trafficking uh, today, uh, you will find those numbers to be very disturbing. Uh, 
okay? And so slavery is something that uh, continues to, to happen today. And again, I think most of us uh, would understand and, and, and say that slavery is wrong. In fact, probably uh, most would say that it is evil, perhaps. Uh, after all, remember, slavery is a condition where uh, one human being is owned by another human being, okay, or, or owned by another. Uh, so ag again, we understand this, and we know that throughout the Bible, uh, slavery is talked about. Uh, we see slavery mentioned throughout the Bible, a practice throughout the Bible because of the cultures and things that were happening at that time. And so, uh, you know, you can read about it, but we know that slavery has been a part of human society and part of human cultures from the fall of mankind in Genesis 3 and that it is, is sinful. And so as, uh, as we come to our text today, I bring all this up to say uh, our text today speaks of slavery. And as we unpack it, uh, you may just come to a different understanding and different perspective of slavery. So we begin by a little bit of review, setting the stage uh, for where we're going to be in chapter 6. And I know we have some visitors that, that haven't been with us, so we've been going through this study of Romans. And we know that uh, the Apostle Paul is the author. We know that we have seen um, him lay out this, this letter in such a way that I, it, I keep reminding us about it because it's helpful for me. I pray that it's helpful for you uh, to remember where we've been and where we're going even, in fact, because Paul begins this letter and, and he starts with, remember, the bad news. He starts with the first three chapters, one through three, are about condemnation, the fact that all human beings, all people are condemned uh, by their sin before a holy God because your sin is against that holy God. And chapter 3, verse 23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so all people are sinners, and therefore all people are condemned to be judged by a holy God. Uh, and so uh, Paul lays out, uh, again, the bad news right up front. But then he transitions into the good news, remember, which is justification, uh, which he begins in chapter 3 and goes through to the end of chapter 5. So we have condemnation, then we have justification, and that is the good news that uh, you can be justified, that you can have your sins washed away, that you can have your sins forgiven, uh, that God has made a way to right this relationship which we broke all the way back in the garden. And so, again, that all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. All are worthy of his condemnation. All are worthy and, and deserving of the wrath that is upon them. But yet God chooses to be merciful and gracious and kind and chooses to love people and to forgive them of their sins. And he does that through the gospel, right? Remember, uh, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, just as we're going through the gospel, let's, let's talk about it. Jesus lived a perfect life that we could not live, that Adam failed, and where Adam failed, remember we talked about it in chapter 5, where Adam failed, Christ succeeded. And so Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law of God and all the requirements thereof, and in doing so, he was now able to be the representative of mankind. Remember, Adam was our first representative. He failed and he sinned, and because of Adam's sin, all, sin has been imputed, or remember, credited to all of mankind through Adam. So through Jesus now, the last Adam, we can have God's righteousness credited to us. We can be forgiven of our sins. We can be declared righteous before God instead of being sinful in front of him. And therefore, we are justified. Remember that word, uh, easy way to remember it is just as if I'd never sinned. So your sins are wiped away, but more than that, you're also declared righteous before God. And uh, if you know yourself, you know you're not righteous right? But God looks at us and sees the righteousness of Christ upon us for all of us who believe this good news by faith. And the good news doesn't stop there. It's actually great news because not only on the cross did he pay for our sins, but he suffered and he died. And three days later, he rose from the grave, leaving the empty tomb and showing that in his resurrection, he validated, in fact, that he is God and that he conquered death and that he defeated sin and Satan and all those things that we are bonded to and that we are sin, uh, slaves to. And he set us free from those things. And that is the gospel. That is the good news. And it is great news, amen, to all those who believe. And so I say to you, as you hear this good news today, uh, to repent of your ways and believe in this gospel. So uh, we came through condemnation, we come through justification, and then we trans, uh, transitioned last week into chapter 6 where Paul now shifts gears and he gets into sanctification. 
okay? So now he gets into sanctification. And he began last week in the first part of chapter 6 with the illustration of baptism. So we just uh, celebrated the Lord's Supper uh, together, one of the uh, sacraments, and the other that we believe, the other sacrament we believe we see that is prescribed to the church is baptism, okay? And we believe in believer's baptism, that once you come to Christ, you then uh, are baptized. And he uses that as imagery, as an illustration to say that just as Christ died on the cross, we too died, our sinful old nature died, and that's a picture of his burial and his death. But then also, in the likeness of his resurrection, we are then raised to walk in newness of life. We are now a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5.17. We are a, a new person. We are being regenerated and have been regenerated. And so now, uh, Paul's point in that, uh, last week, remember the title of the sermon, I think, was Life and Death, because that's what Paul was talking about, spiritual life spiritual death. In Adam, there is death. In Christ, the last Adam, there is life. And that's the, the difference here. And, and that's why he's trying to show this contrast to us that we are, uh, when we're in Christ, we are dead to sin and we're alive to God. And that's only uh, happens when we are united with Christ. As Paul talks about how we are united with Christ and our sinful self has been crucified and has died with him. And now we have been risen in newness of life with him to walk with him, to live for him, uh, to be led by his spirit and to walk by his spirit. Therefore, he ends last, uh, that last part of that text saying, therefore, we do not let sin reign in our lives. And why not? Because sin no longer uh, has authority over us. Sin no longer has power over us. Uh, sin is no longer going to be master of us. We now have a new master. Now, uh, it does not mean, as I say that, it does not mean that we will not struggle. That does not mean that we will not sin. We will continue to sin as we continue to live in this flesh, and we will continue to struggle with desires and temptations and sinfulness and all those things. But we can overcome those things, and we don't live. Remember, we don't live in those things. We don't practice those things. Uh, we, we've been pulled out of the darkness, right, and into his marvelous light. He's taken us out of the mud, and he's cleaned us up. And we don't run back and dive back into that mud and revel around in it anymore. That's not who we are. We do fall and trip, and we fall in it, and we've got to get up and, and repent and confess, and we move on. And, and we've got to grow to be more like Christ every day. And that's what this section, uh, chapter 6 through 8, are talking about, sanctification, uh, that ongoing process. Now, remember, sanctification is a one-time thing that happened when you were saved. You were justified, you were sanctified, meaning you were set apart for salvation and that you were forgiven of your sins. But then there's another part of sanctification that we often talk about, and that's the ongoing process of becoming more holy, of becoming more like Christ and less like our old nature, right? And so uh, if you have been born again, then you can attest there's been a change that happened in your life, and you are no longer like you were, right? Anybody can attest to that? That I once was blind, but now I see, okay? So uh, that's the change that happens, and now this sanctification is something we will continue in until the Lord calls us home. Uh, that from the time that you've been saved until the time of your death, you are to be continuing on this process of growing to be more like Christ and being more sanctified. And in fact, it will be completed, uh, Paul tells us in Philippians, uh, on the day of Christ, that one day we will be perfectly sanctified. We will be glorified and receive glorified bodies, and it will be an amazing thing. There'll be no more sin. Uh, there'll be no more disease, no more uh, sadness, no more tears, and all those things that we look forward to will one day come because we are in Christ. So we're no longer slaves of this, and we're going to unpack that a little bit more now as we resume our study. And let's go ahead and, and do that beginning in verse 15. So if you've got your Bible there in front of you, follow along please as I read verses 15 to 23. Paul says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as a slave for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. 
For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Father God, we give you thanks for all things. We thank you for this time together uh, that we can worship you. We thank you for your word that is an amazing gift to us that you have chosen the God, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, has chosen to reveal himself to lowly sinners like us. We give you thanks for that. I pray this morning that uh, we would be sanctified, Lord, by this text. I pray as Jesus prayed uh, in in the high priestly prayer there in John 17, Lord, that uh, you would sanctify us in truth and your word is truth. And we pray today in Jesus' name, amen. So the title of today's sermon is, Who is Your Master? And last week we talked about uh, life or death, okay? And and so it seems like we're talking about these big situations, life and death. That's pretty serious, right? So is slavery, and and that's what we're talking about here this morning. Uh, It's about sin and righteousness and how we are slaves to them. Paul places an emphasis here in these verses on slavery, and he mentions uh, slavery and says it eight times here, in fact, in these few verses. And he lays it out pretty simply uh, for us, saying that we are either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. Okay, so those will serve as our our beacons, if you will. Those will be our two headings this morning, and that's where we're going to go. Um, So let's go ahead and uh, start as Paul often does with his practice. We'll start with the bad news first, okay, Uh, that we are slaves to sin. Let's see what Paul has to say about that. As we read in verse 15, uh, I feel like... I feel like we've seen this movie before, right? I feel like I've read this before. I feel like I've seen this before because he begins in the same way that he's already done. uh, He began last week's text, and we saw it in chapter 3 as well. Um, By heading off, uh, remember there's thinking, thinking. By heading off some of the thoughts that these people are having, he knows that they're going to have as they hear this letter being read, as they listen to it, as the person who is reading it, he knows that they are, it's going to prompt some thoughts and some questions in the ears and in the minds of the hearers. And so he heads them off right at the pass in anticipation of these things, of their responses. And that was in uh, verse 14, namely that you are not under the law, but under grace. He says, you are no longer under the law, but you are now under grace, verse 14. So now as he gets to f- verse 15, he says that knowing what the people will be thinking, right? Well, if I'm under grace and I'm no longer under the law, then I can just do whatever I please and the grace of God will be poured out upon me and God will receive more glory and it all will be okay. You see it? And that's the thought that he is going against here. Uh, as he says here, shall we sin because we are not under law but grace? And what is his answer? It's been the answer to every question that he's posed to them saying, don't think that way. He says, may it never be right? God forbid. He's saying, no way, don't ever let that thought enter into your mind. That's how far off base you are with this. So he says, may it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? So Paul lays it out for him here and for us. Stating here that you are either a slave to sin resulting in death or you're a slave to righteousness and obedience resulting in righteousness. So think of it in the same way as we we often bring up that there's only two camps, right? There's only two groups of people. And we saw that in chapter 5. All human beings on this planet today are either in Adam or in Christ. They're either in sin or they've been saved. Right? There's uh, the righteous and the wicked. There's the wheat and the tares. There's the sheep and the goats. Uh, There's the saints and the ain'ts. However it is you want to say it, there's only two groups of people. It's not black and white and brown and yellow and and all those things. It's believers and unbelievers, right? And so, uh, again, we see that, that just as you were either in Adam 
or you are in Christ, you are also a slave to sin or a slave to obedience and a slave to righteousness. Them's the two options. God's the one who made them. That's, that's the only two options there are, only two groups. Psalm 1 uh, shows the contrast, in, in fact, between these two groups and says uh, that there is one group who delights in the law of the Lord, right? Uh, he meditates on the law of the Lord day and night, and that he is like a tree planted by a river of water, and he produces much fruit. And so we have this picture of the believer, okay? And then he draws attention and an antithesis here to say that there's another one that is not like that, but there is one who is like chaff that the wind blows away, okay, uh, and perishes, it says. And so there's a, a great picture there in Psalm 1, if you're familiar with it, uh, about this. Acts 24 speaks of those having hope in God and understanding that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Daniel writes about that. Revelation unpacks it for us, that there is a resurrection for the wicked. There's also resurrection for the righteous. And so I say that just to say these two camps, these two people groups are for all of eternity. Because remember, we are all eternal beings. And that's the significance and the importance of this life and death message of the gospel. Because whether you live to be one year or 100 years on this planet you are going to spend eternity somewhere. And that's why this is so important. It will either be in hell under the wrath of God because you've been condemned of your sin, or it will be in heaven because your name is written in his book and because he's preparing a place for you because you've believed by faith in the Lord Jesus and you've been justified by him. And the people, uh, he speaks here now of, of slavery, right? And the people that Paul is writing to, they well understood slavery. Uh, it may be a little more difficult in our day and age because most of us in this room, I would probably uh, be right in assuming that none of us in this room are slaves, okay? You might, you might say, oh, well, I'm a slave to my boss. You don't know this guy. Uh, but it's not the same, okay, as, as what we're talking about here. But Paul, uh, his culture, the people in the time of that culture and that society, uh, remember, they're living in Rome. And so the Romans actually have authority over the Jews. And so the Jews, in some res respect, are under slavery in, in that regard. Uh, but there was, you know, slavery going on in Rome. And so uh, as well as with the Jews, they well understood uh, this idea of about what he's talking about. Uh, but to help us understand it, I want to uh, point out that there is a difference between a slave and a servant, and I'll do so briefly. Uh, but a slave, uh, because it's going to be important in, in our transition here, and, and some translations of the Bible, you might even see uh, servant in, the, in some of these words here. Some say bond servant, and the word bond servant is actually the same as the word slave. But there are two words in the Greek here. One is doulos and one is diakonos. One means uh, diakonos is where we actually derive the word deacon from where we get deacons in the church. Uh, they are servants is what that means. But a servant, a diakonos, uh, still has rights of their own. They will be under the influence of someone else, but they still have rights of their own. They may be being paid uh, by someone else. They may be being taken care of by someone else in someone's home. And in a Jewish culture, they would actually sometimes decide to do that. They would sell themselves to someone if they owed a debt, but oftentimes they would stay under the care of their master because their master was caring well for them. And they would say, my master loves me and I love my master and I will stay as a servant to them. Uh, Doulos, on the other hand, is a slave. This is someone who has zero personal rights. This is someone who is under the complete authority of someone else. And so I say that to you to say the word we see here eight times in our text this morning is slave, not servant. Okay, so that's going to serve as a significant point, I think, as we go through and understanding, not just today, but moving forward in what Paul is saying here, that unlike a servant, a slave again has no rights or freedoms. Okay, they're under someone else's authority. Then he writes here now in verse 17, thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching which you were committed. So what is it that Paul is saying here? He's saying that you became obedient from the heart 
And to what? To the teaching. To the teaching of Christ. To the gospel. That your heart has been changed by the gospel, by the doctrine of the gospel. And now give praise and thanks to God for that. And our reading this morning was from Philippians 2 where it says uh, Jesus emptied himself. And so as we think of Christ, uh, remember, he is the perfect example for us in every way, right? And so we think of him here too. It says Jesus emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, saying that he took on the form of a slave, though he was God. He put that aside to become like a slave. Being made in the likeness of man, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's the condescension that we sing about, the condescension that we talk about. Uh, A lot of hymns talk about that, the condescension that he is God and he humbled himself and became like one of us. And so he was made uh, a little lower than the angels, the author of Hebrews says. And why? So that he could take on flesh and blood, so that he could accomplish what he preached the gospel so that he could lay down his life so that we would be saved through him. And that's why he did all that. He did that so that we would no longer have to be in bondage, enslaved to sin. Because when we believe by gosp- that, that gospel by faith, we are now born again and we are now in Christ. And now if we're in Christ, we're no longer slaves to sin. We are now slaves to righteousness. And so in that, Um, there's been a shift, there's been a change going on here. Uh, Perhaps you've moved, uh, Brian and Heather aren't here today, I think they've moved 14 times, I I don't remember my number, I've moved a lot as well as a kid. And if you've ever moved, uh, you know, you've had to go to the post office and put in for the change of address, right? So that your mail will be forwarded so that you'll receive it now, and so that people will be notified of your change of address. And so, uh, you know, that's the, it probably is not a good one, but it's the only analogy I think of right now to say your address has permanently been changed if you are in Christ. Because remember, we are not citizens here. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are just sojourners here. We're just passing through here. And even in that here, we see a shift in ownership in Christ, okay? The, the place has been prepared for us in heaven. We have this living hope that Peter talks about, this eternal inheritance that he writes about. And so in that, God has transferred your ownership, if you follow what I'm saying. You are still a slave. There isn't a picture here of you are, were a slave and now you're free. That's not the picture. The picture is you're always a slave and you've always been a slave. You were a slave to sin, to Satan, to your flesh, and all those things outside of Christ. Now, God has just simply changed your ownership that sin and Satan are no longer your master. Christ is now your master. You're now his slave. You're now under his authority because you are in him and he abides in you. And so that's what we see here. He has changed uh, your heart. When you come to the Lord, right, it's because of a heart change that Ezekiel 36 talks about, that he must remove the heart of stone and give you a new heart of flesh. This is what we refer to as being born again or regenerated or conversion. This is what it means to believe by faith and be in Christ. So he has changed your heart. Your heart is no longer depraved totally by sin. Your heart now uh, has new desires as you're being transformed. He's transforming, changing your mind. Uh, We'll get to that when we get to chapter 12 of Romans, uh, remembering not to be conformed to the things of this world, but by the renewing of your minds, you're being transformed to be more like Christ. He's changed your will. Your will is no longer to be against God, to rebel against Him and to reject Him, which is all that your will does outside of Christ. So there is no idea of this uh, freedom that we have or even a free will. Uh, I would fact say to you a a good book to read is uh, The Bondage of the Will, which is probably uh, the most well-known book that uh, the reformer Martin Luther wrote. And you can read that or you can get it on an audio book, I'm sure. Uh, But that there is the bondage of the will, and that's the idea that you have always been under bondage, and that's, this comes from here. You've always been under bondage of sin and, and unrighteousness, and now in Christ, you are free from that and free from sin, and you are now enslaved, he says, to God, 
to righteousness, to obedience, to sanctification. And praise be to God that you are no longer in this group, <laughs> no longer is sin your master, but that God now is your master. He changed you so that you now will be obedient. Your desires now line up with his desires. Does anyone understand what I'm saying here this morning? Because if, if, you, if you have said that I believe in Christ and I believe this message of the gospel and you haven't seen a change in your life, you haven't seen new desires, you haven't seen, as Paul says, the old pass away, that you're still living thinking the same things, you're still talking the same way, you're still uh, doing all the same things that you used to do, but you just keep on doing it, just keep saying, yeah, but I'm fine though, because I said a prayer and raised my hand and I'm good to go. That's not justification. That's not salvation. There's a newness of life that comes. You are different. Anyone can attest to this? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I, I am no longer who I used to be. I'm not perfect and I'm far from it. As Paul says, I have not attained it, I have not reached it, I haven't gotten there, but I'm not where I was. And if you are not where you were, then you understand the transformation that we're talking about, right? And, and praise God that you do. And if you don't, I pray that God would change you right now so that you would understand what it is we're talking about. So you are free from sin, no longer enslaved to it. You've now become a slave to righteousness. And that's what Paul's alluding to, as I spoke of in 2 Corinthians um, 5, 17, um, that it says, if anyone be in Christ, that anyone is anyone, everyone, you, me. If anyone is in Christ, then they are a new creation or a new creature. The old is passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. You're becoming new in all ways because you're becoming more like him. So again, remember sanctification is twofold. Uh, one is an outward process that God has done to us, that he has sanctified us or set us apart for salvation. Sanctified, remember, is to be set apart or consecrated. He has set us apart for a purpose at conversion when we believed, uh, and even before that, because he planned for you to be saved before the foundation of the world, right? If we want to blow our minds about it, reading Ephesians 1 and 2. Uh, but we are declared then holy by God. But also, there's the inward act of sanctification that is going on continually within us after salvation, that we are growing to be more holy and to be more like Christ. Uh, in verse 19, Paul goes back to the importance of how we view and use our bodies and the members of our bodies. So we talked about that last week because it was in the text there. If you look at verse 12 and 13, he encouraged us, Paul exhorted us, in fact, to um, no longer use, remember he says, don't use your members, the members of your body, as instruments of unrighteousness. Your eyes, your ears, your tongue, your, your body parts, do not use them to sin anymore and to live in the filth and the unrighteousness that you were living in, the iniquity and, and all those things, but to use them rather for instruments of righteousness. Use your tongue and your words not to break down, but to edify people, right? Using our actions, all the things that we do, our thoughts should be thinking uh, on, on right things and on good things. I think it's Philippians 4, uh, verse 8, where Paul writes, um, you know, that now we are to think on things that are uh, true and things that are just and things that are pure and things that are honest and things that are uh, worthy of, have virtues and are worthy of praise. He says, think on those things. Think on these things. And so we've got to be careful to, to do that. And now he reiterates this and he reemphasizes it, saying, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. So I think all that Paul's just saying, Paul's like dumbing it down for us, right? So that we can understand this big doctrinal principle he's trying to, to teach. And so he brings it down and he says, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, and what did that lead to? When I was living in sin and I was a slave to sin and I was conducting and, and doing all the sins, do you see what he says it leads to? It results in further lawlessness. It's not that you are just standing here and you're just standing still and nothing's happened in your life. You're not growing more holy and you're not growing more unholy. That is not the human life. If you are practicing sin and lawlessness, you are continuing to go down that slippery slope of sin that will just continue to go down into the chasm one day. If you have been saved, now you are walking in the other direction and you are to be going forward and moving forward in your sanctification. 
it's one or that's the other, okay? There is no sitting still. The current is taking you one way or the other. And so we've got to remember in that too that we have a human responsibility for that. It's not that I can just also sit around and, and just think that, well, uh, maybe uh, I used to think this way in high school. Uh, not really, but it was a joke in high school and in science class. Whenever it was when you learn about osmosis and what that is, it was always like, oh, osmosis would be cool if I could stick my science book like under my pillow when I sleep and I would just like know everything for the test tomorrow. That's not what happens, right? That's not how the Lord has chosen to do it either. You can lay your head on this book all you want. It's not going to go in there unless you put it in there. If you read and study it and meditate on it and ask the Holy Spirit to grant you wisdom and understanding and application and all those things, that is our responsibility in sanctification. He sanctified me, He justified me, and He puts me on this path, and He does continue the work, but I also have a role to play in it. You understand? We're not all going to just get all big and buff by just sitting here and staring at the weights. you got to get on the bench press machine, man. you got to pick up some dumbbells, and you got to get to work. And that's how we become physically strong and physically mature. And that's, uh, I can tell you with assurance, that is God's will for you. It is not God's will that you do not become more holy like Him. And I can say that because the Scriptures tell me that, okay? So I know I can stand firm on that. So, in other words, you're going one of these two directions. Uh, you were becoming more sinful, or you are now becoming more holy. And that's the two directions. So, in verses 20 and 23, we see the results now, or the, the benefits. Uh, and, and the word here is, is the fruits, okay? The benefits or the fruits of the slavery here being talked about. Uh, this chapter concludes with Paul pointing out a contrast between the two between the fruit of being a slave to sin and the fruit of being a slave to righteousness and a slave to obedience. You see, again, everyone is a slave. So here, he unpacks it for us. Uh, and we're going to unpack it more as we move forward uh, because he says, uh, you know, that you're either in Christ or you're a slave to him or you're a slave to um, unrighteousness. And there is no distinction. There is no separation, again, like we were talking about a moment ago, that somehow I, I'm saved, but yet I continue to roll around in the mud, and I continue uh, that lifestyle. There is no Christian life, uh, if I can say it this way, there is no Christian life where uh, I've heard this often over the years, uh, that I, I, I hear of people saying that, yeah, he believes Jesus, uh, but he hasn't made him Lord of his life. You ever heard that? or that Jesus is Savior, but He's not the Lord of His life. And I'll just say to you, that's, that's an impossibility. That's not something that's true. There's no Christian life in which Jesus uh, is Savior, but is not Lord. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Lord. And, and so somehow that you can separate those things, uh, let me just put it bluntly and say easily that you don't choose when Jesus becomes your master, nor do you choose when you will submit to him, okay? Those things have been done. If you're in Christ, that's what you do. And it, Paul will unpack that much more in chapters 9 to 11, so we'll, we'll hold off for that for now. But you were a slave to this. You are now a slave to this. You were in Adam. You are in Christ. That's the change that has happened. And so, again, you were never free. You were never your own. You were a slave to sin, you're now a slave to Christ. You are a slave, he says in verse 16, he said, you are a slave to the one you obey. Did you catch that when we read through it? Man, what application that could have, right, in our life? What is it that you are obeying? What is it that you are placing as master in your life? Is it sinful? What did Jesus say in John 14, 15? He said, if you love me, you will what? You will obey me. You will obey my commandments. You'll keep my commandments. You are a slave to the one you obey. And so uh, some self-reflection is, is required, certainly, in that, to, to say what that looks like in your own life. You're a slave to the one who bought you. I bring that up to say 1 Corinthians 6, Paul talks about that and says uh, that we were purchased with a price. Remember, he's, he's speaking there against sexual immorality and says, uh, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and that you were bought with a price? You are not your own. 
that's what the Bible says. That's what God says. And so Paul there says, so then, be, essentially says, be a slave to Christ. He says, honor God with your body. That's what he says. Glorify God then with your body. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. And we already spoke about that price. The price was the Son of God had to die for you to be made right with God. That's the ultimate price that could ever be paid. That's what has purchased you. And so you are, is it too much to, of me to think that because of that price that I've been owned and purchased by Christ, that I shouldn't be his slave, right? That I shouldn't obey him, that I shouldn't love him, that I shouldn't serve him, that I shouldn't desire to be more like him? Yeah, that's, that's fitting and, and normal in the Christian walk. Well, as we close, turn with me, please, to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. So just turn it over to the right a little bit if you're new at navigating your Bible. Go through Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You'll come through the, the five T's there, First and Second Thessalonians, then First Timothy, Second Timothy. If you get to Titus, you've gone too far. <laughs> Second Timothy 2, 24 to 26. And here's the word again, as it says, the Lord's bondservant, okay, the Lord's slave, must not be quarrelsome. And, and here the context is, uh, this is a uh, pastoral epistle that Paul is writing to Timothy, uh, but there's certainly application not just for Timothy, not just for pastors, but for all of us, okay? So in verse 22, uh, excuse me, 24, it says, the Lord's bondservant or slave must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Well, there's a big deal because it, it means that my testimony in the way that I am, I should know the Bible, I should be able to speak it, but I should do it in love, I should do it in the right way so that God may be able to use me as I speak to other people and present the gospel to them, that it says here that God may grant to them the gift of repentance. So again, we give thanks, as, God, as Paul says, to God. Because look at verse 26 now, that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil or the trap of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Clearly, again, those who are outside of Christ, uh, Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians also, they're blinded by the devil. And we pray that God would open their eyes, that they would see the gospel, and believe in it. But outside of Christ, they're blinded by the devil, and they have been trapped by him, and they are being held captive. What does that mean? They are his slave to do his will. When you are in Christ, you have been changed, that now you no longer do the devil's will. You are now to do God's will. Your will now lines up with his will. You have been freed from sin and from the evil one and made a slave to God's will. And so in light of that, he says, you need to keep the members of your body in check. You need to keep your actions, your thoughts, your speech, and all these things in check, knowing what you now know because you are now in Christ. Uh, what you look at, what you think about, how you act, how you speak, all those things. Because how ought you to live as a result of knowing what it is Christ has done for you? Seems like a pretty easy answer, doesn't it? And it's always easy for me as we're gathered here and I'm looking and we're, you know, we're together and we're united in the church. It's hard for me when I get out there by myself and when I'm in the real world and when my life, you know, is, is not easy. Uh, but we've got to do it even then also, okay? Because he says in closing in our chapter here, in our text here, what are the benefits, he says, that you derived? What are the benefits that you got from that old life, that old nature? What good were you getting from all that? He'll later go on to say, you've had plenty of time to deal on all that. All the stuff that you think is a desire in your life right now in this world, you've had plenty of time to be involved in all of that. And he says, what was the result? What was the fruit of that? What benefit did you get from that? Absolutely none. In fact, you get death, an eternal death and separation from the Creator God. That's the benefits and the outcome of that. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, what are the benefits? It says it right there in the text. Sanctification is your benefit, and it leads to eternal life. Amen indeed.
For, in closing, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise because of your greatness, because of who you are, not because of what we've done, and not because of who we are, but because of what you've done. And what an indescribable thing it is that we can even comprehend it to the, <laughs> to the capacity that we can. Uh, this love, this indescribable gift, this amazing grace and mercy that you've lavished upon us. I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. You, you are a great God, mighty to save and awesome, yeah, that you would love a wretch like me and like us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you that we are no longer slaves to sin. Help us to remember who we are in Christ, that yes, we will struggle. Yes, it will be difficult. It will be trying. Uh, but God, we can overcome these things because you have. And because we are more than overcomers, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And so God, we thank you. I think of Paul as he writes in Galatians 2, uh, saying that I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this life that I now live I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we pray today all things in his name. Amen. Our benediction this morning comes from Jude. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. What a great joyful day that will be. Amen. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. God bless you. Have a wonderful day as you go. Uh, please stay and join us upstairs for lunch if you can.